Okay. Oh, one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Oh, the history of rock and roll in 25 minutes or less. Wish me the best of luck. You're going to go mad at me because I'm probably not going to name your favourite drummers or whatever. I missed out on this one, but what I just did was essentially at, ooh, ah, straight into it, no time to waste. Oh, right. Okay, Rock Around the Clock, Bill Haley and the Comets, arguably the first big rock and roll hit which introduced rock and roll, but there was a few people that came before, things like Bo Diddley. All that sort of stuff. So, let me start explaining beats to you and people who came up with the beats and did things with those beats and all that stuff. Now, if I'm going to talk about, um, say, the decade before rock and roll started, 1952, let's call that a year when Rock, rock Around the Clock was released and all that, if we go back 10 years, Okay, we're in the middle of World War II, folks. Okay, it's big band jazz. So you've got Jeannie Krupa and Buddy Rich and... Oh, Simon's back there too. Hey, Simon, hey. So you've got a, you know, sort of like a, a big band jazz thing. Four on the floor, right both with the feet. Right both, right both, right both, right both. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, jazz rhythm. There it is there. And then you take that and put in the backbeat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. for it five minutes before the show but um please don't tell me what's on my mind and there you go i'll do less singing tonight because tim told me i'm crap i don't believe him <laughs> oh we got shenanigans tonight he's looking at me like that he's going to help me out later i asked him anyway so what's going on there's your jazz rhythm right and then the king came along, right? You, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Bubba doopa down. Bada da ba 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 DJ Fontana, thank you very much. Okay, he's the, he was Elvis' drummer during all those Halston days and all that stuff. And what it was, was um, in jazz, there's a thing called jump rhythm, right? And what it is, is you're essentially playing a shuffle, right? One, two, two, two three, and four, one, two, three, and three, hello there. <laughs> and you do it with both hands, right? And then what happens is there's a little bit of molar technique for you... Uh, Drumming aficionados out there. Okay, so what you've got is you, if you're having a look, I'm doing the VIP, the VIP, VIPing post yet again. Some people. Oh, Jimmy Vaughan, uh, Stevie Ray's brother, um, his band. Um, oh, what's the name of the band? But anyway, Jimmy Vaughan. Uh, some people call it a Texan shuffle. Okay, even ZZ Top started out with that kind of stuff, you know, before, you know, all their obey the beard, you know, that kind of thing. See the vip, a vip, and then what happens is that kind of, and there's a beautiful cartoon out there, one of my favourites. Um, next to Duck Dodgers of the 24th and a half century, is the three little bops. Tim, do you remember the three little bops? 
That's it. That's a jump rhythm. <laughs> Gotta be hot to play real cool. Okay. <laughs> That's all about the wolf, you know. Wanted to crash the jam session there, so. There you go. But what happened? We were talking about uh, DJ Fontana and all that sort of stuff with Elvis and people like that and all that sort of business. But then what happens is you've got this jazz thing. And then bit by bit, it's flattened out. You keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Oh, Earl Palmer, thank you very much, umpire. Okay, Earl Palmer um, is one of the great 50s rock and roll drummers. Fantastic, fantastic man. And what it was, was both hands together. You got a vip, a vip, vip, that kind of stuff, right? That kind of thing there. Now, when you're vipping, um, it's good to um, get your... Get your synchronicity happening, okay? So what happens is... What I'm getting into, I'm getting into a twist feel. So I've talked about Earl Palmer, and then the twist came along. Chubby Checker, let's twist again, like we did last COVID summer. You know, that kind of thing. Sorry about the meh. Got to have a laugh at some point. And what a twist is, you've got a, you've got a double tap. One and two, and three, and four, and one and two. Late in the laboratory, late one night. What is it? They did the mash. The monster mash. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> da -dum -ba -da -da -da. I'm on Tim's home ground here. Da -da 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 -dum. And the little tip for a twist is when you're doing the double tap, accent the second, second one. Ah, okay. So you go, uh, 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 uh. back to the double. See? Now, I've been humming it all day. Gonna raise a purse and I'm gonna raise a holler. Bradley Rock. Bout to work so much just to try and earn a dollar. I call my baby, try to get a date. Don't die, son, you gotta work a late. What I'm gonna do? Ain't no cure for the summertime blues. Bradley Rock. The last time I did it, I kept saying my mate down in Tassie, how you going, Brad? Bradley Von Rock and Kate Von Rock. Who did the artwork for Delilah down here? Okay, sort of thing. And Doris back home. Poor old Doris is stuck at home. I'm going to play her over the weekend. So what happens here is um, now we're going into Eddie Cochran, right? And there's the twist beat, Chubby Checker. We're into about 1958, 59, 60. Now at the same time, the twist started to get ratcheted up a little bit. And um, what we would have is... Um <laughs> Surf Rock! Ah. Dick Dale! Ooh. And Australia's own, the Atlantics! Bombora! Oh. Hey. 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 Ping! Ping! Ba -da -ba -da -da. Bombora, ah, oh. they were the first Australian international band. Everybody thought they were American, but they weren't. They were uh, Australian, mate, Australia. 
Yeah? Thank you, mother, for the rabbits. And, and one of the things is that... Um, one of the things about surf rock is you had, to, you had to know your rudiments, you know, that kind of thing. Now, what I'm doing down below down here is uh, the four on the floor bass drum, um, along with the hi-hat on two and four, I'm adding a little bit of the old tambourine. Now, when I was coming up, I was doing a, I was doing a couple of years of violin there. Dad put a violin in my hand, and I went, "What the bloody hell was that?" He figured I'd become an Irish fiddle player or something like that. But after three years of a teacher going, me, 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 like that kind of stuff, I said, I don't really want to do this bloody violin anymore. I like drums. I want to do the drum. Dad never really forgave me, you know. <laughs> Even when I opened up my first shop in West Footscray, when I went out on my own, in 1988, and we had the big party, and he was sitting there with his little brandy and dry. Dad used to like a brandy and dry, or five, and <laughs> like Tim over there. But anyway, I'll talk about that another time. <laughs> anyway, and what it is, he was there and he's sipping away, and everyone's having a good old time. And he said, "Yeah, I wish you'd start with the violin." And I said, "Shit, I just can't make him happy." Anyway, all his mates during the 70s in the pub and all that, oh, he's taking up the bloody drums, wish he'd stick with violin. And everyone used to say, can he play like Sandy Nelson? Uh, let there be drums. Uh. Sandy Nelson, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. So he was king of those days as well with the surf rock. Now, did you notice that when you're playing really quick, one of the secret weapons was the glorious paradiddle, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And that's what you got. See, started out a drumming rudiment, you know, sort of. There you go. So I've got there. And don't forget that during those days as well, you had Bernard Purdy, the ha hat. He was a great band leader in those days, and he's got the moniker for the, one of the most recorded drummers in history, okay? Most sampled and all that sort of stuff. The Purdy Shuffle and all that, but I'm out of sync with that because I'm doing rock and roll tonight. I've done whole shows on that in the past, so there you go. So that's what we've got. Now, we're up to the early 60s, and then as surf rock started to, you know, Dick Dale and the Deltones, Mizzaloo and all this sort of stuff, you know, I've done shows on that as well. But we get into the land of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So what we've got is good old Ringo. And he had a great little shuffle, Ringo did, in the sense that what happens, he had a really clipped clipped shuffle, so instead of one and a two and a three and a four, it came across more like semi-quavers, one e and a two e and a three and a four. And this is where you get the Liverpool jangle, where I, I did this earlier in the year, but not in the context of the history and rock and roll in 25 minutes or less. And what happens here is that he'd, he'd clip the shuffle. Now, the funny thing about this is, um, the Beatles in, at Festival Hall in Melbourne was on TV just the other night, and there were some great camera angles, and you could see his foot 
really blasting out that four on the floor. And that's, that's a little bit, like he's much maligned Ringo in the day, you know, sort of thing. Especially that rubbishy quote about he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles and all that, you know. <laughs> Forget it. He's good. He was good. I always liked him. Come together. I mean, I'm jumping. But that is just a, that is a, a pearler of a drum part, okay? Doom, doom, diddly, dee. But I'm, I'm jumping a decade. And what it is, is the Liverpool jangle is one of those ones where you've got a clipped shuffle, but yet, so it's sort of based on triplety, kind of semi quirk kind of thing, and then you hear George and John playing straight, so it's got its own kind of jangly polyrhythm, which Shag and Malone last week, in amongst the, all the lame jokes, and all that sort of explained a little bit. The hemiula! But imagine the Beatles doing it, you know, with the early, early uh, Beatlemania kind of stuff, a la 64, 63, 64, all of that sort of biz. And that's what goes on there. But he's, um, I, I, I tend to think of a few of, dr few of the drummers in pairs, okay? So if I'm thinking about Ringo and I'm doing that kind of stuff, I'm also going to be thinking of uh, Dear Charlie Watts. <laughs> Okay, of the Rolling Stones. Because they were the two biggest bands through the 60s, arguably. Okay. And don't forget that when Charlie Watts was, you know, he, he's there going, yeah, Mick, whatever you want, yeah, no worries, Keith. Yeah, okay. He'd always have that, always there. And later on, he started going, that kind of thing there later on. So there's Charlie Watts through the 60s, all that sort of business. And during this time, now we're into the 60s, I hope I'm going, how am I going with time, Tim? I'm into the 60s. Have I got time to, yeah, doing all right? Okay, thank you, mate. Anyway, what goes on is that we've got, we've got the mid-60s and then, ah, oh, bum, 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 people try to put us down. Why am I playing the hi-hat? Keith Moon never had a hi-hat. So we're talking about... Uh, good old Keith Moon. Now, Keith Moon and Ginger Baker, I'm bringing up Ginger Baker. Um, Keith Moon was the first drummer to have two bass drums in the mid-60s. He beat Ginger Baker by a smidge because uh, Ginger Baker wanted specific sizes and stuff. But Keith Moon just went straight to Premier Drum and said, I want what he's having. Um, what it was was uh, Duke Ellington Orchestra came out to um, England and they went, who's this dude with two bass drums and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't Louis Belson, who's the famous jazz drummer most aligned with uh, the Duke. It was actually um, Sam Woodyard who was doing it. Because once, once you got Louis Belson in the band and he goes off and does his own thing, the guy next up said, oh, I better get two bass drums as well. <laughs> man, oh man. And all that. Then Louis came back and all that. All oh, great drumming and all that. But basically, Keith Moon's style was he just went for a walk in many kinds of cases, right? It was, it was fairly unsubtle sort of thing. So you just have that kind of... Right, left, right. Now I've got boot cam down here, which will come up a little bit later. So you just got that. And he'd just be stomping away, man. Wide open. There you go. Keith, the madman. There you go. And when you're talking about uh, Keith Moon, and we're talking about like what I would call pairs sort of thing, um, although I did mention Ginger Baker, I, I'd, be, I'd be quite remiss if I didn't mention Mitch Mitchell at the same time with Jimi Hendrix, because when you're talking about guys like Ringo, Star from the Beatles and Charlie Watts from the Stones, they, they're laying down beats and they're great grooves and all that. That's why, that's why we're listening to them today. But when we're listening to, say, The Who and Jimi Hendrix, who had a bit of a friendly feud going, you know, all the way to Monterey Pop, 67 and all that sort of stuff, 
You were talking about a couple of explosive drummers there with uh, Mitch Mitchell and Keith Moon. So you're talking about a 60s where the style was wide open, right? <laughs> And there's a, a little thing that I, I teach my students is a, a little thing called two and two. And what that is, it's um, because it's wide open and flowery and fiery and all that sort of stuff. Jimi Hendrix loved Mitch Mitchell's drumming because it was just free and all over the place. Although, I have to tell you, um, the Band of Gypsies album, I love that album. Machine Gun, and, oh, that's a little slice of history there. But what goes on? is when we're talking about, you know, Mitch Mitchell and, and Keith Moon and all that sort of stuff, um, there's a lot of two and two going on, which is a two-bar phrase, but with a two-beat fill-in. So you'd have one, two, three, four, one, two, three and a four, yeah, one, two, and three and four, and one, two, three and a four, yeah, one. And I just call it a two and two, two-bar phrase with a two-beat fill. Eh. You'll hear it on Come Together again too, by the way, on the, during the outro. You'll just hear Ringo com continually doing a two-bar phrase right at the end on the fade-out. Two-bar phrase with a two-beat fill-in, and that's it. Mitch Mitchell had that in spades. Keith, um, he, he and Pete were like, you know, mm, mm, like that sort of stuff, because he'd be playing straight while Rog was singing up the front. And if you have a look, he's singing along at the back right sort of thing and then you've got Pete doing his lead break but every time he did the big windmill oh that was Keith's turn to go fully sick mate yeah you know sort of thing so so you'd have I did a earlier in the year I did who live at Leeds 50th anniversary because this is the 50th 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 anniversary of that album I love that show I love doing that I love that album like Fat Man at the Opera kind of stuff. I start, I think it's just straight up, you know. Uh -oh. You know, it's just straight in. It's great. Oh, woof. I might listen to it tonight. Mm, see how we go. Anyway, there you go. So we're doing Keith Moon and Mitch Mitchell, Birds of a Feather. This begets, of course, I'm going to talk about this dude. That's the lick of the century. If you couldn't do that in the 70s, you were nothing. Tim, you were nothing if you could do that. That's right. Oh, there you go. But anyway. Now, I did that earlier. Where do you think John Bonham got that from? Okay, so, you know, you're talking about... Um, Little Richard, you keep a knocking but you can't come in. I've mentioned Earl Palmer, all these people and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time coming up with John Bonham, and I've done so much on John Bonham, um, uh, it's like every, every episode, someone's saying, can you do something on Bonham? Well, I sort of just did, didn't I? <coughs> and all that sort of stuff. But no. You know, sort of thing. The big boots and all that sort of stuff. And the hi-hat. Uh, where do you think I got that from? There's John Henry Bonham right there, you see, so. And what I always said about Bonham, when they got to starting to play, you know, the huge concert, you know, they were in, you know, Madison Square Garden sold out six nights and things like that. By that stage, I mean, they're talking, playing to, you know, football, you're playing to footy in football fields and stuff. So he had the, the big ass 24 inch, uh, <laughs> You know, the big, big ass 24 inch ride symbol. And poor old, you know, poor old Jim up the front, you know, sort of, you know, I need a bit more definition, Bonzo. So that's where it comes. It's the very first track on their very first album. Okay, good times, bad times, you see. So there's the definition, right? If I didn't, if I took that out, It's a beautiful, expensive sound. I've had this beautiful symbol for a long time, but let's face facts, it's <laughs> You need a bit of definition there. So, eh, 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 eh. so there you go, you know. Thanks, Bonzo. I can go to Stairway to Heaven now. So that's what happens there. Ah, ha, ha, ha. 
come from the land of the ice and snow. So there's your John Bonham. But you can't really talk about John Bonham in the 70s without mentioning <laughs> Ian Pace. Bum, 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 bum. And both of them were masters of the lick of the century. And what it is, is um, in the most basic of ways, it's right, left, foot. And you can do it other ways. John Bonham did it a certain way. Ian Pace was fantastic at um, that straight kind of thing. And you'd build it up. But that's only half the story. The hi-hat is right in there because what you're actually doing is you're putting your right hand with your left foot. I've explained this so many times. And even when I stop explaining it, someone asks me how to do it again. That's what it is. So there's that. And then you put the left hand in. And you're off. If you couldn't do that. And then you move the snare drum when you need to. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. And of course you've got to do a crossover. Hello ladies, see you after the show. <laughs> there it is, you know, you've got to be a bit of a showman at times. <laughs> you go. <sighs> Wish I hadn't said that. Anyway, there you go. But at the same time, uh, some of the great... There was this thing called progressive rock, and I've got to work quick. Okay, and you had Carl Palmer. Oh my God. From Emerson Lake and Palmer. Had Bill Bruford. King Crimson, and yes, Barry Moore Barlow, one of my favorite drummers of all time, one of the most undersung drummers ever of Jethro Tull. Amazing stuff. All that sort of stuff. I'm going to work really quick, and of course, Neil Peart. Okay, and. Um, Mm. Passed away earlier this year, tragically, and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to keep moving on. Oh boy, Terry Bozio, Vinnie Colaiuta, okay. The trick to Zappa's um, reggae in the late 70s with Vinnie Colaiuta doing it, the trick that I always had tried to do with, um, with uh, his reggae kind of business and doing Lucille has messed my mind up and all that sort of stuff is a left hand start double paradiddle. So you get that kind of thing. Now I'm mentioning Stuart Copeland from the police doing that. I've got to work quick now. And we're into the 80s. Hot for teacher, Alex Van Halen. There's supposed to be a China symbol up there for that, but... And then... And when you're getting into that kind of stuff, um, you're starting to get into metal. Now I'm going to bring up Lars, okay, because you're starting to get into the Metallica stuff. And one of the great albums is Master of Puppets in the mid-80s. Speed metal and all that sort of stuff. Basically, it's three speeds. You've got a half time, normal time, cut time, Blast. It's like a four-speed gearbox. Three on the tree. Four on the floor, Tim. Hey. Three on the tree. And there you go. So that's, that's, kind of, that's that kind of thing there. You can't go past Phil Rudd. Jailbreak. And then you're into all sorts of different things throughout the 90s and stuff like that. And I understand, I'm running out of time, so what's going on is I'm going to finish off with some prog metal. You've got people like Mike Portnoy from Dream Theatre, Danny Carey from Tool. You know, you're talking about all the things that I talk about in other episodes. Polyrhythms and polymetrics, it's all brilliant stuff. And their newest album is, um, go listen to any one of the 15 minute long songs. And um, what you'll find is that one hand might be doing uh, one thing, three, Right hand does four. Hey, ooh, hey. Listen to the snare drum. Ba -da, 
There it is, Danny Carey. He's um, right there, right at the moment. And um, I was going to bring up Thomas Hartke from Meshuga, and um, because he is truly a nice gent, a couple of gentlemen there, sort of thing. That's a bit of an in joke, that one. Um, but that's all right. Um, and I've basically started with the start of rock and roll, and I've gone up to now, because I'm talking about Danny Carey and the latest Tool album, I suppose. And there you go. And um, I think I'm running out of time. I think I've got 60 seconds, something or other left. Is that right, Tim? Keep going, I'm okay. One minute, okay. So, I think I made it. I think I, I, think I got as many, I did as much name dropping as I could, okay. But what it is, is when you got... Can he play like Sandy Nelson? Yeah. Wish it stuck with the violin. Yeah, anyway. But then you end up with. <laughs> okay, there you go. I think I've got it. I think I did it. Anyway, my name's Chris Quinlan. It's Melbourne Muso's Facebook Live. I had fun doing that. I love every genre, every one. Okay, I could spend all night listening to Elvis's greatest hits, then go straight to Tool, I don't know why, and then come back to Led Zeppelin, go out to Tull, oh, and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, I hope you got something out of it. Um, where, uh, what are we doing now? Um, I'm going to do the credits. Uh, this is the beautiful Alex Theatre. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Tim and Simon Barnett right over there uh, for putting up with me and asking me back and all that, and I don't take anything for granted. This is incredible, especially in the times that we've got now. This theatre, Alex Rocks, um, and the Alex Theatre in total, and everyone within it are trying to do their best with this shitty time that we're going through right at the minute. And it, you know, we just roll. And whatever we can do, we're doing for you. There you go. And um, yeah, and it's going to end up on Channel 31 uh, next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. And thank you again, I keep saying thank you. Uh, small mercies and gratitude is the thing um, because you helped us uh, keep uh, community TV alive for another year, maybe another 10, hopefully another, you know, whatever, because we need it. These are the times for things like that. But I'm out of here now and I hope you got something out of it. Um, give me uh, a day or two and I'll have it up on uh, the Melbourne Musos page and um, all that business. And um, I hope I can get all of it onto Channel 31 next Wednesday at 10 p.m. So I'm out of here. My name's Chris Quinlan. It's Melbourne Musos, Facebook Live. I want to thank these two blokes over there, Simon and Tim again, and have a great weekend. Take care. I love you all. Hey! Bloody COVID, take away my dollar. Da, 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 da.